Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Raymond Peterson. And I'm Alan Singer. Dr. Alan Singer, educator, historian, regular on Media Watch. And we're taping the show this Wednesday, March 27th. It should air on Manhattan Neighborhood Network the following Monday, which probably is what? April 1st? Something like that? On April 1. Oh, uh, <laughs> April Fools. Let's hope Manhattan Neighborhood Network doesn't make a fool out of us and air a different show instead of this one. But <laughs> in any event, <laughs> if you don't see it on MNN, it'll be on YouTube. So, but lots of stuff in the news. We need to put some of it in perspective. But as this show is called Media Watch, the breaking big news story for us in the media is the fact that the powers that be at NBC, I guess it's NBC Universal Group, the parent organization, decided that they would hire Rona McDaniels. Is that the correct pronunciation of her name? Rona McDaniels. It is McDaniel. I believe so. McDaniel. McDaniel, no S. Okay. The former uh, RNC chair. Republican national chair uh, at something like $300,000 a year <laughs> as one of their paid contributors. And uh, it flew into my radar, but it didn't fly in the radar of the rest of NBC because NBC had the biggest on-air revolt of any media corporation I have ever seen in media in all my years in media. And I've been in this business since 1969, folks. So that's a long time. Um, uh, I, what I saw and read was they hired Ronald McDaniels just before, or made the announcement about hiring her just before she was to appear on Kristen Welker's Meet the Press show. And Christian Welker did not know or had barely had time to absorb the fact that the guest that had been booked for her to do Meet the Press as one of her weekly guests was this former RNC chair, McDaniels, who she thought she was going to be interviewing as a normal guest interview. Turned out she's now going to be a paid contributor. Uh, and so basically, when it came to light, one of her other guests was the former host of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Yep. <laughs> and I'm not a big Chuck Todd fan, and I got a lot of bones to pick with Chuck Todd, but I may forgive Chuck Todd all those bones I had to pick because Chuck Todd called it what it was, a major, major insult to the NBC heritage of great news coverage. And he said, let's talk about the elephant in the room, I'm paraphrasing. She said, your boss is just threw a real curveball at you, Kristen, by having you have to interview this person here, blah, 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 blah. And so he called his bosses out for hiring her because his claim was, hey, these people have been calling us liars under her ages. She's one of the ones calling us liars. She's one of the ones who was part of the election denies when we were trying to give the American people the truth. She's one of the people who were basically undermining our democracy with all these lies. And so why would they do that and try to hire her? And so he just blew the whistle on that major faux pas. Alan, what else popped out <laughs> after he did that? Well, just uh, Micah Brzezinski and uh, Joe Scarborough, who do the Morning Joe TV program, they said, no way will she appear on our program as a paid commentator. We welcome conservative Republicans, but not people who lie about us. You know, really, I, I wonder you know, now they've hired her as a commentator and the individual shows it, it's up to isn't it up to the anchor who is like usually also the editor? Isn't it up to them to say whether or not somebody can come on their show? 
Well, evidently, they do have that managing editor role. Some of them do. And that's why Brzezinski and, and Scarborough could say she's not going to be on our show. Yeah, Even exactly. They made the announcement. The bosses said she'll be appearing on, across all our platforms. <laughs> not, well, all our platforms don't necessarily mean all our shows, evidently. <laughs> the issue is not that she's a conservative. The issue is she has no credibility because of years of lying. And now she sought this job because Trump dumped her. Right. And not why are we bailing these people out? Yeah, part of the reason those folks were upset is because there have been all kinds of internal cuts on personnel mm -hmm. in the NBC Universal Group. Mm -hmm. And so they were saying, one of the stories I read was, how the hell are you going to find $300,000 to pay her, who's been calling us lies and has been undermining the democratic rule of norm, for $300,000 a year, you people have lost your mind. And so guess what? <laughs> uh, Joy Reed was part of the bandwagon. Rachel Maddow. Out, and Rachel Maddow spent 29 and a half minutes of her one hour show really taking them to task about how far they had come in disrespecting their own journalistic tradition by and, and as Scarborough and Brzezinski said, it's not about not wanting conservative voices on the air. We just don't want somebody who's an election denier, who's been lying about us and calling us liars and basically just not paying service to truth and true journalistic integrity. How can you bring her in on board this particular organization? So the boss is back down. <laughs> uh, Eric, the issue of misinformation also brings us to the current debate over the internet because there's, you know, the right wing groups, including people like Elon Musk, they are fighting that there should be no regulation of speech on the internet mm. because they want to spread lies. Now, okay. Alan, you know, it's interesting because their campaign, the New York Times and PBS, PBS actually brought on some of the independent think tank research groups, organizations that have been tracking online misinformation, disinformation, and stuff like that, right? And basically, those people, they interviewed a, a key individual who's been in the forefront of that battle. And she said, look, we've been trying to get the federal government to actually call attention to this and we've been sending our research to the social media platforms ourselves because this thing is just basically out of control he said but now the conservatives have been pushing back and calling us whatever and they have co-opted the battle and the new york times had a very interesting interesting sunday march 17th headline trump allies are winning war over disinformation their claim of censorship stymies efforts to tamp down election lies online. And have you seen uh, Jim Jordan and all his people have been showing up, these right-wing conservatives that are now running the, um, what is it, the Congressional Oversight Committees that deals with media and, and stuff like that. Same people who've been trying to... It, really? Peach hmm. or malign Joe Biden and go after Joe Biden's son, the, the impeachment inquiry that has no teeth, those hmm. people are also the ones pushing this, quote, censorship of conservatives by social media and the government's influence on social, plat social media platforms. And so the Times' article was, their claims of censorship stymie efforts to tamp down election lies online. Pick up, Alan, where you were talking oh. about. Well, what I think is teachers are facing a lot of difficulty around this because the teachers are, as they prepare to look at the 2024 election, one of the responsibilities is to show multiple uh, perspectives on the candidates. But what do you do when one of the candidates just blatantly lies, is disrespectful of the democratic institutions, and the online sources are just false. 
you can't just bring those online sources into class and say, well, this is a different perspective because they're lies. And so this problem of, of social media is also a problem in the classroom. I've had students in the past who, who, who brought, cited Breibart as evidence of their position. Breitbart. Oh, Breitbart. And they well, said it's, it's well, we can tell our listeners, viewers, they may not remember. Breitbart is the guy who founded that far, 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 far right wing thing that basically was as bad as 4chan and 8chan. And, and QAnon. Right wing lie manufacturing mills. Right. They basically, just, they just put out anything they felt like. And because people saw it online, they claimed it was right. true. So when they, the way they handled it is just the same way Trump speaks through innuendo and suggestion. It's, well, we don't know, but we got to be suspicious that this may be the case that space aliens are behind the Biden steel. Yeah, right. But 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 speaking of chilling effects in the classroom, Raymond, did you see that that link about the Indiana law? No, I did not. But you were you were you were talking about that earlier. Uh, yeah. Look, the the state of Indiana actually passed a law. I'm not sure if I can pull that up. I'm going to try to see if I can find it. Um. But basically, what they did was they what was said, putting up? I mean, they they said um uh, what, what was it uh they, they want, uh more diversity. Yeah, if you don't have more diverse political views in your classroom discussions, then you are subject to being fired, even so, if you are a tenured professor. And their diversity is the right wing agenda, which is not yeah. being discussed. Well, it might be discussed, but it's not being pushed. Yeah, they don't say that in the law, okay? Yeah. Basically, they crafted the law because of Jim Jordan in Congress and all his people talking about the stifling of conservative viewpoints online and on college campuses, et cetera, et cetera. So the Indiana legislature passed this particular law saying, if you're not promoting diverse points of view in your classroom, you're subject to termination, even if you are a tenured professor. So what, if you're in academia, what does that do? Is the line between diverse and false? Ah. I mean, because I think, I think most professors are being diverse and presenting both sides of an issue. Well, they try to are, are presenting their areas of expertise. Right. And if your area of expertise is uh, human evolution, you are not going to discuss creationism in your class because that's not part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And if your uh, area of expertise is the transatlantic slave trade, you're not going to present points of view that justify enslavement. So mm -hmm. what this does is it really empowers right-wing students to take professors and then bring in snippets and claim, see, this professor only has one point of view. Yep. And that's very scary. Yeah. The, 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 the blowback in Indiana from professors across the political spectrum, by the way, even conservative professors were saying, this is not where you want to go <laughs> in, in educational circles. This law is anathema to freedom of speech and academic freedom. And so basically what you're seeing is people like Jim Jordan and his folks pressuring the federal government to get out of the business of policing bad information, disinformation, and outright lies on social media platforms to the point where it, they actually brought a case that ended up at the United States Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court last week when we were, tape, we were taping this on the 20th of March, about eight, seven, eight days ago, they were having hearings in the Supreme Court of the United States trying mm -hmm. to parse where is the censorship? Where is the disinformation? Where do we come down in trying to allow the federal government to be able to say, yeah, that's an outright lie. Yes, no. Yes, you should be policing that. And how much of it is coercion by the federal government? 
and how much of it is just basic logical common sense about protecting the American electorate from disinformation, especially in an upcoming political season. So according to the New York Times, Trump's allies are winning war over disinformation. I'll quote a paragraph that says, waged in the courts, in Congress, and in the seething priests of the internet, that effort has eviscerated attempts to shield elections from disinformation in the social media era. Mm -hmm. It tapped into, and then critics say, twisted the fierce debate over free speech and the government's role in policing content. And they have won that battle. Right, because they been able to identify lying with free speech. So they don't call it the right to lie. They call it a defense of free speech. That's mm -hmm. correct. You're right about that. So, but here we go on who's policing what and whatever. But Alan, you had another example of trying to police individuals' rights to whatever as Oh. Part of our political process, talk to us about the campaign against the squad. Oh. We were talking issues of right to free speech and a right to your own political perspective. Right now, there are major campaigns, especially on the campus, but soon in Congress, to stifle all protest about what Israel has been doing in Gaza, where over 30,000 people have been killed. Many of them, women and children, or most overwhelmingly uh, civilians who are not involved in the conflict. So what has happened is that there are groups that are basically policing what's happening on colleges, suing, claiming that protests against Israeli behavior is anti-Semitism and right. is being used to discriminate against Jewish students, create an unhealthy climate. So this has been going on, and this is, again, right-wing funded. But now there's a new campaign. APAC, which is a pro-Israeli lobby, has organized candidates that are basically a stronger supporters of Israel to run in democratic primaries to try to defeat uh, members of the left squad in Congress who have spoken out most sharply for a ceasefire and protection of the human rights of Palestinians. Uh, and they've raised mega money in their campaign. And if they succeed, they will silence opposition to US funding of what is a looks like going to be a genocide in Palestine. Yeah, I... I... I don't know if you've seen the Washington Post story on that, Ray, because I know you you got a, a post subscription. Yeah. It may have come into your inbox, but but the bottom line is they are going to pour a ton of money into more moderate Democrats to run in primaries against people like the Lee, um Illinois, Omar, Bush, Bowman Lee, in New York. And Bowman in New York is probably the, one of the most vulnerable. I, I don't know if they're going to try to to mount one against Casio Cortez because she's got a really strong home base and she takes care of staying close to her constituents. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't try to mount a challenge against her either because they're really well-funded. They've got a ton of money uh, and, and they don't like uh, the fact that these left progressives are putting out information consistently that's calling for an immediate ceasefire because they just are not up to allowing that many civilians to just die at the hands of the Israeli government because they want to root out Hamas terrorists. And I'm not saying Hamas don't have terrorists hiding amongst the civilian population in Gaza. They do. But you got to draw a line on how many people you're going to kill indiscriminately just because you want to get those terrorists. And these congressional people, long before 
Chuck Schumer got on the Senate floor and called out Netanyahu for doing what he was doing and not trying to get a ceasefire to solve the problem. They were calling for this ceasefire a long time. And it upset a lot of people. And I guess APAC got upset enough to start funding these campaigns, Alan. Yeah. Now, one of the things that interests me is here you have Chuck Schumer, who made the statement that the big problem in getting peace and a resolution in Palestine, Gaza, and Israel is Prime Minister Netanyahu. And he called that Israel should have elections and replace him. Well, what I would like to know is if Chuck Schumer is now going to go out and defend these Democratic congressional representatives who have been a very strong part of the Democratic Party in Congress while pushing it to be more responsive. And the same issue as Hakeem Jeffries, who's an excellent politician. He's from Brooklyn. Is he going to take a side and say, look, whether you agree with these people on all the issues, these are very responsible political leaders who we need in Congress. I would like to see Chuck and Hakeem defend the squad members. It's their responsibility. And I, I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, yeah, you know, it's their responsibility, but this is not a new problem with criticizing Israel, uh, the government of Israel, without being labeled an anti-Semite. I've heard that for like the past 40 years, you know, because I've had, on many occasions, I've had problems with the Israeli government, not the Jewish state, the Israeli government, and have been labeled anti-Semite because I, I, I dare criticize the Israelis. Yeah, and, we, and I specify the Israeli government. I have no problem with the people of Israel. Beautiful country, beautiful country, beautiful people for the most part. These right wing, I, 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 I don't know. It's, I can understand why a lot of people are keeping their mouths shut, because they, especially politicians, because they don't want to lose their money. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of American Jewish money that goes into politics, and they don't want to lose that. And, and I don't respect any of them for that. I mean, you know, if you've got something to lose, fine. Stick up for what you believe in. But yeah. again, back to what I was saying, you know, if you criticize Israel, you're an anti-Semite. Well, well, one of the things that's interesting, you know, there, there are not that many Jewish voters. And they're very congregated in New York metropolitan area, Chicago, and California. So their votes are not going to influence this election. But what you have are right-wing Christian nationalists who are looking at Israel as a symbol of the second coming in the Armageddon and uh, see these wars as proof that the world is going to end. And they have a lot of votes, and that's very scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's part of the irrationalism of the Trump uh, following. Yeah, but I don't think those are the people that Bowman has to worry about here in New York. Okay, Georgia. that's true. I believe Bowman and APAC going after Bowman is going to try to use the money angle no. to try to outmaneuver Bowman and get him out of office. But that's that. There was something else I wanted to talk about pertaining to what you were saying about criticizing the government of Israel for its actions. I remember when that second intifada. Happened was that the early 90s, Alan? Yeah. As a historian, you probably have a better pulse on it. We did a story with um, William Kunstler and his daughter on Media Watch, and they were in Israel covering what was happening. Uh, and William Kunstler and his family are Jewish, but basically they're also humanitarian people who worry about human rights. And so when they did whatever documentary it is that they did, we brought them on Media Watch to screen parts of their documentary. And it was basically how the Israeli government were not treating the Palestinians properly and how in desperation the Intifada occurred because of how they were being boxed in, apartheid treat, treated, overly patrolled, et cetera, et cetera. And losing their lives as well, in addition to losing their property. The land that supposedly is supposed to be the Palestinians for the two-state solution 
has been gobbled up from the 90s till now. And this current right-wing government in Israel is basically trying to get more settlements to make sure that there is no land left to make that two-state solution a possibility. So the fact that people in this country politically have been trying to get a two-state solution from day one so the Palestinians' rights could be respected, and Benjamin Netanyahu from back in the days of Camp David and wherever he was one of the initial negotiators has been trying to stop the two-state solution. It just means Netanyahu has decided, this is my opportunity. This is me reading geopolitics historically from then to now. And he's using that atrocity that Hamas committed to further his end at making sure there's not a two-state solution. And that's why he is not trying to get a ceasefire. And that's why, in my opinion, now this is opinion, he is not trying to worry about the hostages still being held. For him, they're a pawn to get his end. That's my opinion. I think I, I, it's a very reasonable opinion. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction because Netanyahu has been accused of helping to build up Hamas over the, uh, the last decade as a way of prevent, having a, a villain that he could use to prevent the two-state solution. But the other weirdest thing, a lot of the right-wing um, Israeli ministers have been calling basically to expel the Palestinians from Gaza. Well, in the United States, David Friedman, who was the former Trump ambassador to Israel, has called on the people of Gaza, the Palestinians, to emigrate to other countries. But even more ridiculous, son-in-law Jared Kushner has decided that Gaza waterfront property would be a good investment if the Palestinians moved out. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I saw that story, and I wish we had more time to go. What does your clock say about time, Alan? I got 50 seconds. Yeah, I saw that story, and we need to actually dig into that. But, but, but that goes to my point. Basically, Netanyahu, Kushner, Friedman, they want to remove the Palestinians from Gaza. Not so they can start afresh and maybe have reasonable Palestinians in there. That's so Israel can occupy and develop the waterfront property. According to Kushner and according to Friedman, it's a much better outlook for the Palestinians who can share in that wealth and prosperity. I, I'm not sure these people are, are really sane. But what I'm saying is... Eric, 15 seconds. Well, all right. So we don't have more time. So... We'll stop and visit this again. This has been Media Watch, folks. I'm Alan Singer. I'm Eric Tate. <laughs> I'm Raymond Peterson. <laughs> and that's Alan Singer. <laughs> Alan Singer has been very instrumental. And catch up to us on Media Watch EVT on YouTube. And we'll catch you the next time, folks.